Okay, to do a final recap on exactly where we're at with the super project, um, we're gonna put the last of the drive shaft back in. I just pressed in the brand new universal joints, and again, I am, uh, as much as I'm an advocate of you tackling as much as you can from home, this is one of those things you have to really think twice about because you do need some specialty tools because of the uniqueness of the alpha drive shaft. Um, it can be a frustrating job, it's an easy thing to ruin. Um, so you really might just want to consider sending that thing out and let somebody else do it, especially if you've never had your drive shaft balanced. It's an opportunity to get both of the things done at the same time. Now, with that said, if you recall, when we first started this project, we marked the, uh, the differential and we marked the first section of the drive shaft. So when we put all this back together, it's exactly as it was prior to disassembly. This is essential because, again, if the two drive shafts are 90 degrees or 180 degrees out from where they were before you disassembled, you very well may make the drive shaft out of balance. So it's just something to consider and it's a very important step. The other thing I want to remind you of is do not lose those bolts that hold all this stuff together. They're very special bolts. They're very particular and they're designed for these drive shafts. And not just any old bolt will do. So um, those are your key points. Now I'm going to just put it back together. And if you recall, I use multiple marks as not to be confused by scratches that might be on the, uh, the drive shaft. So this is my uh, front section because that's where the expander slot is, or I should say expander shaft is. Um, there's my multiple marks there. And, and lo and behold, I did not put this one back in exactly where it was. This is why it's a good idea to mark them. And there are my multi-marks right there for the other side. So I'll set that one up, so that'll be fine that way. And this one's this way, and, and that's ready to go back together the way it was. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and bolt it together. When first hanging this, I don't recommend that you put the lock washer on the nut side because there's very few threads that are exposed. So what I always use, I always put one on each side, one on the drive shafts, one on the differential side, just a couple threads going. Then I put the other one on the other side. Because you're going to have to telescope it to get it to meet. And like I said, when you first start, there's effectively very few threads exposed. So trying to get the washers and all that stuff on there, what a hassle. There. Now that I got the thing hung, now I can put in more nuts and bolts with washers. And by the way, if you're trying to do the block washer on this side, do it on the bolt side, not on the nut side, because there is enough room on one side of the shaft. Scratch that. That's incorrect. Now when you're doing this side, put the bolt coming from the first shaft going through to the second shaft. The reason I say that is because this side, the first shaft side, there is no room for a nut and a bolt to happen. All right, or, And the reason I say that is because there is no room on, we'll just call the north side. There's no room for a washer and a nut, so, I mean, you'll figure it out. It's kind of obvious. Okay, so the drive shaft's in. Um, it's not bolted down completely. It's still loosely bolted. There's a couple of things that I want to make sure that we're clear on. One, you can't just go snugging this thing down. You have to use a filler gauge and make sure you're biting down on this thing equally so when it goes flush that it's not slightly skewed on um, the bolting locations. In other words, if you have one slightly loose compared to the rest, what's going to happen is it's eventually going to work itself out and it's going to become loose. Okay, so that's one thing you need to know. The other thing you need to keep in mind is, is normally, and I emphasize normally, there is what's called a factory witness mark on these drive shafts to make sure they're put back together exactly the same place. But that is usually just a little dimple of, from a punch. After years of driving, rock and grease and everything else, they kind of you know, pelt these things, they could be very difficult to locate. In this particular case, I couldn't even tell you where they were at. I'm sure they're on there somewhere, but I can't find them. So that's why we're going to make sure when we put these things back together, that we're assembling them just as they're supposed to be. So the next thing I'm going to do is, this isn't the torquing scenario yet, but what I am doing is I'm snugging down the drive shaft 
first section, then the second section, equally using filler gauge has to make sure that I'm not tightening one side of the drive shaft faster or closer to a mating surface than the other. Now there is very little room to work with on these. Trying to put a uh, trying to put a ratchet on this, there's nowhere for it to go because there isn't enough uh, perimeter area for you to use such things. So, okay, so I just felt it slightly snug itself. Okay, so that's where I'm stopping on that. I'm gonna rotate it 180 degrees. And then we'll walk down the other side now. Okay, so all bolts in the front were snug down equally. Remember, make sure the bolt on the front and on the rear are pointing to the rear of the car. Okay, they need to be consistent on this side and on this side. That's rule one. Rule two, make sure you're using the right nuts and bolts that came with the drive shaft. Rule three, make sure the drive shafts are mated back up the way they were before you try this project. Rule four, put tranny in dry, but when you put fluid in that, change the gear oil in the diff as well. These are just really kind of no-brainers, but here's the situation why I bring it up. If a car has been sitting for a great deal of time, Fluids, especially oils, are somewhat hydroscopic. What do I mean by that? What I mean is they draw in moisture. Mind you, the differential, for example, is not completely full of fluid. It's not from the top to the bottom, okay? It's only about halfway across the gearing. So that means anything that is in there is absorbing somewhat moisture because you have a weep hole on the top of the diff that just constantly is there to vent and exchanges air. So if your car hasn't been moved for a very long time, that fluid could have a great deal of moisture content to it, okay? So it just makes good sense. You gotta put in new fluid on the tranny anyway, so you might as well change out the gear oil and the dip as well. Alright, so those are just the common sense things you should really keep an eye on, okay? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, one of the uh, sadder things that's happened over the last few years is that these throw-out bearings on these mechanical clutches, you know, it, for a while there we couldn't even get them, so I can't really complain too much. But what has happened was, is we started to get real cheap springs to hold them into the cradle, okay? Which, you know, so when we see them, when we pull them out of cars, if they're still good, I tend to want to keep them. Okay, so, but the other thing is, is here is a nice, uh, you know, throwout bearing. The problem is, is I will show you the throwout bearing that was in the car, okay? It very well may be good. I'm not feeling any notchiness to it. It doesn't have any excessive spin to it, so it may very well be just fine. But the replacement one, and we're not going to risk that because, you know, here we are putting in a brand new clutch and everything. Why would you bother, right? But here's the replacement one. The replacement one the backing or the mounting system is plastic. I don't know, for the sake of saving a buck or two, that kind of drives me nuts because this is proven to last for years. Metal frame, metal casing, everything's metal, it's great. This, being plastic, I don't know, I just don't believe that this is gonna last forever, I just don't, okay? Um, so, I don't know. When you get your replacement clutch package and you order up that new throw bearing, you're going to be a little disappointed because they're now plastic instead of uh, good industrial grade steel. Just a thing. Alright, so while we're on here, the other thing we're going to do is I've already taken the bolt out of the, or excuse me, the nut out of the cross, the center link. So, again, remember, that thing's got to be out of there in order for you to put the motor in. If you don't, the weight of that motor alone is going to bend this thing real easy. So. Don't, uh, don't forget that. All right, so we're here. I'm gonna throw the high dollar plastic throw up bearing in. Okay, so we're getting an awful lot of questions about the, uh, the super refresh project. And we elected to do a few things with this car um, simply because we had the ability to do so and stay within a reasonable budget on refreshing this car and making it worthy for the road. Now this Super hasn't been on the road since 1985, so there was often a lot of things that we knew that we didn't want to assume were worthy. We didn't want to assume the transmission was in good shape, so we changed it out with a, uh, a modified lightened uh, 
transmission, and we kept it a mechanical transmission. Now, with that said, we elected to go with a two-liter motor, primarily because we already had the motor in stock. It just needed a little bit of refresh on it. And it was a cheaper way to go than to go through the 1600 and make it a, uh, a higher-performing streetcar, if you will. Now, with that said, a lot of people do a two-liter conversion on their cars. There's a couple things you need to know. One, if you're going to do a two-liter conversion on the car, you have to have the flywheel modified if you're running with the original transmission you had. Now, if you were to go with a two-liter transmission, that's a hydraulic transmission, and there's an extensive amount of modifications you need to make to the car you know, to accept that. So oftentimes, it's just simply easier to go with modifying a few other things instead and keeping your original mechanical transmission. There's really nothing wrong with it, so why not keep it? Okay, in this particular case, uh, because we have two liter going into a mechanical transmission, we have a lightened flywheel. But this flywheel, if you notice, it's fairly stout. It's fairly thick, although it's an aluminum, very well balanced flywheel. Um, it's fairly stout because it has to be compensated for the fact that this is a two liter ring gear going on a 1600 mechanical transmission. So there's a couple of variations of light flywheels you need to know about. So if you're seeking out a light and flywheel, don't seek out a light and flywheel for a two liter motor if the transmission isn't two liter. I hope that makes sense. Now the other thing we did is we sent out the carburetors we had on this. We sent them out and had them restored and set up ideally for this motor. Okay, so that's what we have here. So these aren't brand new. It's just that when we get them restored, this is how they come back. All the parts are, you know, re gold catted and they're appropriately cleaned, the jettings are redone, everything is done to match this particular motor. Now with that said, a really good carburetor builder is going to ask you all the right questions. You're going to want to know what kind of motor it is, you're going to want to know what kind of cams you have. And these are things that are um, imperative for just a, a perfect drop in and go kind of setup. Okay, the other thing that we did is, is instead of running, right here, instead of running the original distributor on this, one of the easy, good ways to get reliable performance response is by just simply going to the Morelli Plex style uh, distributor. Um, we tend to hang on to those when they come in stock. They're easy enough to have them um, redone if they're, if they're tired. And that's what we did here. It's just a good, simple way of getting reliable response out of the motor. Um, so it has some Morelli Plex, improved carburetors, light and flywheel, better clutch pack and um, you know other than that the motor itself is ready to go obviously when you change out motors you always want to take advantage of changing out new motor mounts and things like that but effectively that's about where we're at on this um, we're going to talk about a few other things on the process of putting one of these motors in in a minute but for now I just want you to get a sense of what we're doing for a budget build this is not a bad way to go now we still have a few other things we're exploring whether we're going to put in what we call here in the states a euro air box um, or if we're just going to put, you know, like ITG covers on or something, we don't know just yet. Um, we're still exploring with it, but for effectively, you know, this thing's ready to go. Now, the one other thing this thing's going to get, and you'll see it in a little bit, is we're going to put in our own um, header, okay? Now, <clears throat> this is not a commercial for headers, um, but when we went through the process of developing these headers, we ended up developing three different types of headers. We developed a header for 1600 and 1750 performance motors. We developed one for two liters like this and we developed one for the twin spark motors. Now about the headers, typically you will see um, outfits out there design a header that's one fits all, meaning the Nord designs, you know, 1600, 1750, two liters. But when we've done all our testing on it, we found out that that wasn't ideal because one if not two of those typical kind of motors are going to suffer from that design so but in this case because this is a two liter we're putting in the two liter drop-in um, header and the reason uh, it's going to be a simple drop-in on this because if you remember way back in the beginning of this project we moved the e-brake over a little bit just to create the additional clearance we needed it's only a issue with supers that run the original e-brake so we slightly need to move it over to accommodate for the space. It's, uh, it's not something that's in the other car. It's not an issue with spiders or an issue with GTs, but because of the awkward e-brake system on the um, Supers that you have to make that modification. No big deal though. It was like 15 minute job at most. 
So let's get started. One of the many cool things about this shop is we have these very unique, um, older style lifts in the shop, meaning that the front post and the rear post of the lifts work independently. So you can get a car at some really crazy angles if you had to do something. Alphas are kind of notorious for knowing that easiest way to put a motor and transmission in is to get the rear end up, way up. Okay, so to kind of recap where we're at on this, um, the motor's in now, it's mounted to the transmission. A couple of things, if you've never done this before, a couple of things you should probably think about. One, make sure the spark plugs are actually out. Take the alternator off as well. Um, I realized that uh, before the battery on the camera died that I didn't show you that we take the, the alternator out. The reason we do that is because if you have the existing battery tray still in place, it becomes extra difficult to negotiate the motor into the engine bay, okay? So again, spark plugs out, alternator off, belt off. The reason you're doing this is because oftentimes when you're trying to make that clutch back up to the transmission, the splines are not matched up to the grooves. In fact, it's almost guaranteed they won't be. So when you take spark plugs out, you're able to put your socket on the actual crank pulley and you can turn it and kind of just get the, the, the clutch to move a little bit so it can align to the receiver on the transmission. Um, if the spark plugs are out, there's no compression in the motor and it makes that job much easier to do. Okay, so now that we've got both those things happening, I'm going to go ahead and put the car up in the air and I'm going to finish bolting this thing up and wrapping up putting the motor in. After that, I'm going to put the alternator back on with belt. Then I'm going to put the headers in. So those are the few items that are left on the punch list for today. Um, we're going to order up a really nice stainless steel exhaust system to go on the, the exit end of this. Um. Okay, so before I put the dust cap on, this is about the last opportunity we're going to have to make sure everything's fitted just like it should. I always like to double check the mechanical uh, bearing setup on these because you know the spring clips that hold the, uh, the throttle bearing in place are kind of kind of chintzy a little bit. They don't require a whole lot of energy to hold that thing down once it's engaged, but you know, when you're trying to wrestle a motor onto the transmission, it's really easy for a spring clip to pop. Um, everything here is fine, so I have no worries about that. Um, the bearing looks like it's matched up quite well to the, uh, the clutch pack, so I guess we're okay here. So now what I have to do is I have to make sure we always get our ground in, which is right here. Uh, then after that, I need to go ahead and connect the mechanical after I put the dust cover on. But before I do all that, I have to put the starter in, okay? You don't want to get too far down the road on this thing without getting the starter in now, especially with the, the center link dropped out of the way. It makes it so much easier to get your hand in there and do that. All right, also, if you were really, really savvy, you notice that I had left the two liter studs on the motor. Um, I tend to like to do that because those longer studs help align the motor onto the transmission. It makes it a little tighter in the fit trying to get it in, but effectively it's really useful to help get that motor onto the actual bell housing. Um, at this point, we'll double nut it and we'll take them out and we'll put shorter studs in. Um, but, you know, the, the punch list of things that need to happen is fairly long still. Um, but effectively, you know, we're in. There's no damage to the engine bay. Uh, again, I'm not an advocate for you to do it this way. Um, I really encourage you that if you're going to tackle this, you take the motor and transmission down as one. Um, but anyway, so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go up top. I'm going to get the uh, header in place while I can, where it's nice and easy to do that. And I'm also going to show you our trick little alternator that we use. Um, if you haven't seen that before, you might enjoy this. Um, we've done a lot of research on alternators, and we really found that we like the way this setup is. We'll show you what that's all about. Okay, so the clearance between the exhaust, the steering box, the Super's e-brake mechanism, 
and the foot pedal, or the, yeah, the foot pedal assembly on one of these is pretty tight in tolerance. Um, so to make a single piece header, um, like we did with you know single mounting flange, was no small feat. That took a lot of work. Um, now, if you remember several videos back on this 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 particular car, we modified the e-brake just by hitting it a little bit, bending it over just to get it to where it's behind the steering box instead to the side of the steering box. That created all the space we really needed to uh, drop the header in. So now we're just going to go ahead and do that. The one small challenge you have with a, with a header on a car that has a battery box with a heat shield run, it can be a little tight to put in at first. Typically, worst case scenario, all you got to do is just lift the motor up a little bit, just a little bit, and it'll drop right in. So it's not a whole lot of work. So we'll show you what it's all about. Now these headers come ceramic coated. Um, we used to make that an option, but not anymore because the ceramic coating, yeah, it does elevate the overall cost. But what it really does is, is the benefits are just too far outweighing to not have them coated. It also protects the steel, you know, from expansion, traction, and heat. The overall radiant temperature of the exhaust drops by about 200 degrees. And this reflects in horsepower that comes back to the motor because it's less resistance. Heat creates resistance. So it's a very free flowing exhaust. Now, again, I said before that we have a couple variations. And the reason that is is because there is legitimately no fair one fits all setup. You see a lot of the Ford and two setups of just straight pipes that merge underneath the car. Those all find them well and they have perfectly good applications. But that particular design doesn't show to be beneficial on motors that are 2 liter versus 1750 and 1600. Um, so that's why we kind of really work with the way we were doing this. <clears throat> now, until the ceramic coat is fully baked in from a couple of cyclings of running the motor, it kind of has a little bit of an ease to be scratched. So you want to be gentle with it. Now, we already have our exhaust gasket in. It's uh, one of our own single piece exhaust gaskets. Now, I have this sitting in there, so all I'm going to do, just because I don't want to force it around this battery box, I'm going to lift the motor up just a little bit, and it's going to drop right in. Piece of cake. Just fine. Okay, so all we gotta do now is bolt it up. Okay, so the motor's in, the tranny is mounted, and the header is in place, and everything's fine. Now I'm gonna go back and put the alternator back in. Now, I want to talk about this alternator uh, because this is probably the ideal practical replacement for given scenarios. The Bosch alternators, um, they don't typically really care for the high RPMs and their output's not all that great and pretty big. Um, the Denso alternators, the output on special ones is pretty high, but they're very expensive. Um, and the small little guys kind of just don't really look right inside the engine bay, if that makes any sense. So we did some research and we found a really suitable one-wire replacement that kind of meets the in-betweens. The Denso is ideal for its lightweight for like race applications, but if you're going to have good RPM and you need good output on, on the amperage, um, you'd have to buy the really expensive one to suit most of those needs. But if uh, that isn't really in your, uh, your desire to kick down that kind of coin, um, there is an alternate. Um, Wes Ingram of Ingram Enterprises did some research with an uh, alternator remanufacturer and found that this GM alternator um, is a fraction of the price. Um, and it is designed for phenomenal output. This thing produces uh, roughly about 65 amps. 
but it, the beauty of this is it can sustain a really high um, RPM output. Because um, you got to figure with the pulley that's on here, this thing needs to be able to sustain somewhere in the area about 14, 15,000 RPMs. And this thing's actually designed to sustain at 22,000 RPMs. Um, this is uh, kind of the common alternator used in some of the uh, Pro Gas Racing Series and you know NHRA stuff. Um, so this really seems to be ideal. Now normally we would want to pull it in our uh, billet pulley system, but again, this is a budget job for the, for the most part. So there isn't really um, justification for that kind of funding. Um, so we're just going to go back to the traditional V-Belt, but we're using this alternator because, again, this is a fraction of the price of the Denso, and it's a fraction of the price of the, uh, the, uh, the Bosch. So it's a good drop-in replacement for um, tired uh, Bosch alternators and um, for those who don't want to spend the Denso money. There you go. I guess one of the things I like the most about this uh, this GM alternator is it looks just like the Bosch, but the difference is it's about oh about two thirds the size, so it's uh, significantly smaller than the Bosch it would be in there, but it is uh, better performing in every way. Um, so uh, if you want your car to kind of look like the part, then uh, this probably isn't a bad way to go. You know, the laundry list of things that have to still be done on this car before it's truly roadworthy is pretty substantial. Sway bar mounts are pretty knackered. The, uh, the torsion, or we call them the dog bone uh, bushings on the sway bar also uh, quite past it. Even though a car has sat for the last 25 years, doesn't mean those things stop deteriorating. They do deteriorate in place because you know, just as bad as road use is and trolling ends and things like that on rubber, sitting in place is also equally as damaging. You know, temperature change, you know, temperature change affects everything. Um, you know, cold winters, warm summers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, these type of things really do take a number onto the, uh, the rubber parts. So, you know, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting in a full stainless steel exhaust system to attach to our header. Um, we need to consider upgrading the brake package on this car, which we're probably just going to have these rebuilt. Um, but I'll tear them apart and inspect them first. If they're just, you know, a little uh, corroded on the inside, we'll try to hone them out with a special honing tool that we have for, uh, for brakes. Um, other things we're going to try to do is we're also going to improve the handling on this car. We are going to put on a bigger uh, tire with an improved compound. You know, just in, encourage those things, you know, so it's a fun car to drive. Uh, but effectively, um, you try not to look at the total big picture. Um, the car needs to be safe, obviously. It needs to perform, but it also needs to stop. It needs to be able to turn in and not have an unpredictable feedback in the wheel. Um, though this is uh, a street car, it's not inconceivable that the owner is going to push the boundaries a little bit. So we want to make sure that everything is working as it's you know designed to do. Um, but effectively, it's it's getting so much closer. I cannot wait to hear this motor run. Um, okay, so that's about it for now.